we're live. Hi, and welcome to uh, Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about a variety of books with a Marxist and anarchist perspective. And I'm joined by Justin Clark. Thanks, thanks for joining me, Justin. Hi, Corey. It's always good to see you. Thank you. Um, oh, as always, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's good to see you after a couple of weeks. We've been been fairly busy. We're getting into the summer now. It's it's now the beginning of June as yep. we record as we record a stream tonight, um, which is absolutely insane. This year's going so fast. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, but it's it's very exciting to um, be back on the show. I um I was I'm really looking forward to chatting about this book tonight because it is one where I think I think I'm going to I'm going to try my best to do some and rectify something that I think I I haven't really done uh or done well which is we've talked about Lenin a lot on this show okay yeah I think and that's a lot fair. of it, and a <laughs> lot of it is is I wouldn't say like laudatory but a lot of it we tend to be more like even handed with it pretty positive Generally. Pretty positive in general. So tonight is going to be an exception to that because I oh, feel no. <laughs> like we are going to get into talking about some of, I think, a lot of the, some of the fundamental flaws that exist okay. within Leninism itself. Okay. Um, and why um, the book we're talking about tonight is, I think, so crucial for understanding that. Um, before right. we get into that, do we have anybody joining us tonight? We so do. Far? We have Kerrigan is on. Hi. Hello. Hello, Kerrigan. How's it going? Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. That is it for now. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, you know, when once more people come in, um, you know, we'll we'll uh, we'll stop and read comments sure. and ask and answer questions and so forth. So tonight is the second part of a three part series that we are doing on the works of the um, the Dutch Marxist Anton Panacek. Um, the first episode that we did was. Um, Marxism and Darwinism, which is done fairly well um, in terms of views. Yeah, actually. Um, and yeah. I'm very happy about that. Um, and I, and I, I've also seen some, some, I think, actually like fair criticism of some stuff that I said in it regarding kind of like tools and the development of labor and language and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and there, I think I could have. There were some I thoughtful comments that didn't get deleted. <laughs> no, there were very thoughtful comments. And I tried to respond to them, essentially saying okay. that I could have been more precise in my language about um, what makes humans unique. That's right. Um, in, re in relation to other animals, primarily language, um, that, that we have the capacity for abstract thought. And that's developed through the labor of interrelated individuals. Like, that's kind of the, the broader thing. And animals also have this. Like, so, like, Animals can also have that that sort of um, development of tools or the development of, of, of kind of abilities based on their relationship to laboring in the world and interacting with the with the outside world via labor. So it's not just unique to humans, it's to everything because that's how evolution works. Right. Um, so I could have been a little bit more clear about that. So thanks for everybody for the thoughtful comments. Um, and uh, and uh, if you want a more concise version of what I just said, read the YouTube comments on the Marxism and Darwinism episode. Um, I'm glad that one did well because it was a very interesting episode and it sort of my hope is that this one will do well too. Mm -hmm. um, so tonight's book is Lenin as Philosopher, a Critical Examination of the Philosophical Basis of Leninism by Anton Panacek. Okay. Now, <laughs> there are numerous books written about Lenin as a sort of political theorist. Right. There are many written about him as a revolutionary, revolutionary, revolutionary figure. Yep. There are many written from the perspective of him as a politician. And we sort of talked about that in the episode on Marcel Liebman's book, because Lenin was not just a theoretician, but he or a revolutionary. He was also a politician who could be pragmatic, who could often appear as if he was contradicting himself, would do things that. Uh, and, and made decisions that seemed counter to a lot of what his theoretical work had outlined. Um, yep. And Panacek's <laughs> perspective is that that whole thing that you think of like, well, he's actually subverting, like he's not, he's like subverting Marxism or he's not really, you know, he's not doing Marxism right. And Panacek essentially makes the conclusion it's because he's not really doing Marxism at all. Oh, geez. Um, okay. So, um, and in general, like I, I've, I've studied a lot about Lenin. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to read about Lenin, but I do think there are deep, 
deep structural and, and, and deep philosophical flaws in his system. I was never really able to figure out how to outline that. So yeah, another book that I read in preparation for this one, and it's not really a book, it's much more of a pamphlet, but it's a okay. book, um, Lenin, A Study in the Unity of His Thought by uh, Georg Lukács. We're going to do Lukács in a later episode. Uh, I don't know if it's this year, next year, where we're going to read his classic book, History and Class Consciousness, but because um, Lukács is in that sort of Western Marxist humanist tradition, as is Panacek. Um, and so uh, Panacek is, is far more interested in him as a philosopher and, and how he understands the world, not merely as a political actor, but just as a thinker. And Lukács's book is much more about politics. It's it's that um, that that Lenin's core philosophical contribution was the the um, the potential of revolution. Okay, it's kind of Lukács's thing, right? Now Lukács wrote that small pamphlet on Lenin in 1924, shortly after Lenin died, and so it's it's both uh, an insight into him as a political theorist, but it's also kind of like a, um, like a eulogy or, or some kind of like, you know, tribute to him. And it kind of reads that way. Cause it's okay. not, as, it's not as thorough or as like um, astute as say like Panacek's book. So that's why, because originally I considered maybe doing a, a duel talking about both of them, but I think the Lukács book isn't really worth talking about for the oh. episode. I think it's much better to, to, to do more of his more substantive work, um, uh, sure. and which like History and Class Consciousness, which we'll do later on, either this year or next. Okay. Um, so what, what spurned Panacek to write this book? Um, it was the, the really the only philosophical book that Lenin ever wrote, which is called Materialism and Imperial Criticism, which was published in 1908. Okay. Um, and it was written in, a, in, in the context of Lenin after the 1905, the failed revolution in 1905, he goes back into exile for a number of years and he goes back to the source as it will. So he's reading all of the sort of classic philosophers who had an impact upon Marx or Marxism. So he's reading Hegel, you know, Georg Hegel. He's reading, um, Mach, Avenarius, Dietzschen. Kant, like he's going back and trying to get a sense of like, how does everything work? And sort of trying to establish first principles um, about two components of philosophy. One is epistemology, which is the study of knowledge mm -hmm. and ontology, which is the, which is the study of being. Yeah. And so um, the thinging of a thing, <laughs> the thinging of the thing. Exactly. Um, and what Lenin's conclusions are, are often in many ways at odds with what we think of as being classical Marxism. So there really is, I think, in many ways, a very clear theoretical break between Marx and Lenin. Um, would I say that Lenin is a Marxist? Yes. I, I think that right. it's, I won't go so far as to like uh, Panacek would say he's not really a Marxist. Right. Well, he, he is not really a Marxist in certain contexts. And we'll get into that when we talk more about okay. the book. But um, but Lenin is absolutely a Marxist. It's just a Marxist of different kind than the classical sort of golden era or the golden age, as Kolakowski calls it in his book on Marxism, of the sort of the second international, you know, of people like Kautsky and Bernstein and others. Um, so what we get a sense of is that the stakes are rather high. Um, Panacek is writing this book, I think some, some, I think maybe a 20 or 30 year gap between when Lenin wrote his book on philosophy. So, okay. so Lenin's book and materialism and imperial criticism was mostly not available to the West until decades um, later after its publication and years after his death. Um, part of that was just the nature of it not being a particularly successful book when it came out, which is obscure philosophical tract by in many ways, nobody to most people other than people who were in the sort of the Russian Marxist circles. Um, uh, it's weird to think of Lenin as a nobody, but in 1908, he kind of was. I guess, um, right? Um, but uh, so Panacek is sort of looking at it with the hindsight of knowing what came of the Russian Revolution. Um, and, how, and it's sort of, um, it's 
transfiguration into Stalinism and, and right. the political oppression of the of the Soviet state. It would be pretty hard to not have that affect your outlook on what you're reading, right? Exactly, which makes makes it a very different book than Lukács's because Lukács's is written within the year that Lenin died. It's not, yeah. you know, Stalin had only really been in the high position of power for two years at that point. It wasn't, you know, because there is an overlap period between Lenin still being alive and giving some advice and Stalin having power. So it's like there's in, in position of a real central authority. Um, so Panacek's writing about it with hindsight, kind of saying, well, how did we get to this? And to him, it's it's very much a logical outgrowth of Lenin as a philosopher, Lenin as a thinker. Um, and a lot of it comes to thinking about um, that there was a growing divide between Russian-oriented Marxism or, or the sort of Marxism-Leninism as it would sort of develop and Western Marxism or sort of classical Marxism, which... Um, was very critical of the Soviet Union later on. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be as critical until, say, the 1940s and 50s, of course, after, especially after the death of Stalin and the mm. thaw, you know, Khrushchev's secret speech, and a lot of the crimes of Stalinism being kind of exposed. So you, you get a sense of that Panacek is a part of this Western Marxist tradition who really feel like the Leninists did not listen to us, and they made all the mistakes that we told them they would make, which I guess is fairly easy to say kind of in hindsight. Yeah. But, um, but I still think it's important. So yeah. Panage yeah. I just was going to say a lot of anarchists, like, and I, I kind of fall into this category of people who like, they go like, well, the anarchists warned about all this stuff. Right. <laughs> Nobody listened to them. And in exactly. fact, they got murdered for it. So. And you're right. And there were and there were people in the Western Marxist tradition who also said this was all going to happen and no one listened to them yeah. and it happened anyway. And what I think you come to is the conclusion that Panacek was one of the early theorists and a long line of, 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 of Marxists who would sort of be using Mar use Marxism to critique the Soviet Union, not to support right. it or to uphold it. And the, the most glaring term that it's often used to describe what the Soviet Union was, is state capitalism, yeah. which is what it was. Um, you could call it state socialism if you want to, but you could also call it state capitalism, which is a term that Panacek uses. It's a term that later thinkers like Paul Maddock and C.L.R. James would also deploy to describe what the Soviet Union is. I think it's fairly accurate in terms of what the Soviet Union actually was, because the Soviet Union didn't abolish a hierarchy. It didn't abolish class distinctions. It just changed what they were. Yeah. So the Soviet Union went from, you know, Russia went from being under an absolutism of the czar and you have the peasantry and sort of a nascent proletariat and those class conflicts to a state capitalist system where the upper echelon, the sort of the elite of the society went from being the the church and the monarchy and the the sort of ministers and the courtiers of power who supported the monarchy to a system of party bureaucrats and the intelligentsia who became yeah. sort of the elite who then ruled the Soviet Union. That's true. I mean I I, I mean I can't there's no bones about it. I mean I'm I'm also reading another book right now by a Soviet, uh, a former Soviet military official and Russian historian, Dmitry Volkogonov, called Autopsy for an Empire. And he lays it out pretty clearly, like, this is exactly what happened. Like, it was, there wasn't much workers' democracy in the Soviet Union, not in the way that people were often sold as it being. Now, could you make the argument that the Soviet Union was a better system than, say, Russian absolutism? Maybe. You can maybe make that argument. But the fundamental relationship between the masses, the people, the workers, the peasants, and this sort of governing class that was never elected, you know, they won a revolution, but, you know, they, they, they came out on top of the revolution, but they were never elected. No one chose them, you know, and, um, and other than the, the mass assent, assented, you know, you know, gave them assent and assented sense, to them yeah. coming into power. Yeah. Um, and so, with all that in mind, I think, well, how did this happen? Like, why, why did it develop the way that it did? And very much like Lenin in those early years after the, the first Russian Revolution in 1905, Panacek goes back to the, 
to the basics. He goes back to the center. He goes back to the past to figure out, okay, well, how did he, how did we get here? And so Panacek makes a very clear distinction. Um, before I start, do we have anybody else on who has any comments, uh, questions? There are no new comments, actually. Okay. No, so. Okay. Cool. So Panacek makes a very clear distinction between two types of materialism. Okay. So when we think of materialism, the sort of colloquial version that we use that in English in the West is something like, oh, you're materialistic. You like to have a lot of things, right. that kind of thing. It's not what I mean. Consumer. <laughs> it, consumer. Materialism is a philosophical concept. Um, and it's opposed to idealism. So my great way of, you know, my way of explaining that to people is thinking of that great classic painting of Plato and Aristotle. And they're in the, the academy or the, in the symposium. You have all these people around them. Plato is pointing to the sky and Aristotle is pointing to the ground. Mm -hmm. Plato's pointing to the sky. He's referring to idealism, that ideas exist first. And those ideas are manifested and live independently of reality. And those ideas are then manifest in reality. So like right. there's the perfect ideal of a chair yeah. or there's the perfect ideal of a table or there's the perfect idea of a person. And we map those objectively existing ideals onto things in nature. Yeah. Aristotle's point at the ground, he sees it completely differently, that ideas are derived from material and sense experiences. So he's a materialist in that the material world is real and our knowledge of it is derived from senses. Yeah. Ideas exist, but they only exist in relation to the material world that we understand through our senses. It's not, ideas don't kind of exist like in the ether. They don't exist like right. in a vacuum. You can't go and get them. That's not they how they work. They come from something else, yeah. Yes, so concept a concept like the mind, the mind, for a materialist is an emergent property of the brain. Yeah. So when we think of the mind, it's just a catch-all term that we use to describe all of the very complex interrelated phenomena that make up the experience of being a thinking being who is the capacity for abstract thought. Yeah. So Which ideas is, do, ex yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, which is why we don't accept like concepts like the soul or like, yeah. you know, we don't believe that there is an afterlife because once your brain is gone, you're gone. Yes, exactly. So materialists don't believe in a soul or at least they don't believe in like an immaterial soul that right. would exist independently of the body. You can use the soul as like a metaphor to right. like describe like your likes, your dislikes, things that move you, things that... Uh, that you have an emotional connection to, like you could describe the that human as human spirit soul. or whatever. The human <laughs> spirit, right? Like that that stuff that kind of exists, but it doesn't exist independently of of material conditions and material yeah. reality. So Marxism is in many ways a reaction to German philosophical movements of the 19th century, specifically Hegel. So Georg Hegel, the very influential philosopher, the idea of dialectics as a thought process is from him. But the thing about Hegel is that it's all about getting to that, you know, pure spirit or, or pure mind that exists independently of everything else. It's sort of a reaffirmation of Plato. Mm -hmm. um, the young, and that's kind of the right Hegelians. So they're more politically conservative. They follow more of the late, later Hegel writings where Hegel's very like, positive okay. about the German monarchy and so on. Then you have the left Hegelians or the young Hegelians who often go back to the younger Hegel, who's a little bit more radical. Marx is coming up in this milieu. So he takes dialectics and he makes it, he, and, 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 and he makes it materialistic. This is where dialectical materialism comes from. It's recognizing that Hegel's real method of understanding the interrelationships between things is really important, but not getting to the conclusion that there's these independent ideas that exist outside of, of outside of reality. Um, and so historical materialism is a key component about that. Um, and uh, that, sorry, uh, yeah, well, not to interrupt, but uh, sure. Ker Kerrigan did bring up a point said, uh, I think it's fair to say Mikhail Buk Bakunin's warning to Marx about the people's stick has been vindicated. Yes. Yes. And I think that there's a real need 
and, and I see this very real need on the left to get some of these questions right. Like, I think that it's part of the reason that I've left certain political movements. It's part of the reason that I've kind of evolved as a thinker is that, like, quite frankly, a lot of what people call socialism or like the left or like whatever isn't really socialism. It's it's some form of sort of state, state sanctioned, you know, control that doesn't have yeah. that much input from the public. It's it's you know, and it kind of reinforces a lot of the same problematic relationships and right. struggles and hierarchies that aren't that that you said you promised would be kind of removed if we did this. Yeah. Yeah. And and part Sorry, of that I is also to, I didn't mean to derail your line of thinking. No, but. I think that's I think that's good, and that goes into kind of talking about thinking about Marx and his no notion of historical materialism. That um, as yeah. as Panacek writes in the book, like man can only be understood as a social being. From the individual, we must proceed to society, and then the social contradictions out of which religion came forth must be dissolved. So this is kind of the early Marx. He's writing to kind of critique religion. Why are you critiquing religion? It's the underlying ideology which justifies monarchies. Mm -hmm. It's justifying the existing right. established order, right? So you're challenging religion. But Marx goes further, and it's like he says, he basically argues that like we should critique everything, not just religion. Right. And that's him going farther than other, th you know, thinkers like um, Feuerbach and, and so on. Um, so, you know, that's our relationship to nature and how we are. So we don't stand apart from nature. Um, we're, we're not alien to it, as Panajek writes. Um, with our labor, we transform the world and through said labor and transforming the world, the world transforms us. Mm -hmm. And so um, as people expand their labor, it changes the world and it changes us. And as that goes forward, it builds different systems. Ideologies develop out of those systems. They're directly connected to social processes, which come out of material conditions. Religions are not something that are sort of like, they, they don't exist abstractly. Right. They are very concrete phenomena that come out of material conditions. This yeah. is what this is what Marx meant when he said, like the opiate of the masses, the side of the oppressed people. It's it's he he's making it very clear that if you were to get rid of a lot of these distinctions, i.e., communism, that you 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 end the contradictions, then the need for like religion would sort of naturally wither away because no one would need and would have a need for it because right. a lot of what religion had promised people would be given to us now. Um, and you could make the argument that that's a little utopian, and I would argue it kind of is, but like that's yeah. the point. Yeah, The, the point could, is to sort of envision it and then make it real. Yeah, no, there's no doubt that like there may be still a spiritual kind of thing that people want to believe in or what have you, like a desire to fill that, you know, a certain re need, but you might, you might still have the withering away of religion, you would just wouldn't necessarily have the withering away of that type of belief system. Yes, exactly. So a lot of times you would see religions developing into instead of being like, full world systems that sort of uh, that um, give you a sense of metaphysics, like that, like there is an immortal soul, there is a heaven, there is a hell, like the tripartite God, you know, like all of those things, like those are all metaphysical concepts a lot of those would sort of wither away and what would replace them was, was would sort of be religion as philosophy where right. you would maintain, you could say you're a Christian or you could say you're a Muslim, but you're not really into the supernatural part of it anymore. You're maintaining the sort of the cultural ethos of it or some of the moral tenets of it and so on. Um, Cause that's the stuff that matters. That's the stuff that affects people more than anything else. And that's the problem that the new atheists have is they get it exactly ass backwards. They think that the ideas are the really the important thing that create the behaviors. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. You got to go the other way around. Yeah. The behaviors reinforce the beliefs. That's how it really is because that's how people operate. That's historical materialism. The way that we, the way that we do things changes the way that we are. And subsequently it changes the, the, the world that we live in. Which is also uh, like the means and ends theory from anarchism. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's 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 all of that.
So you have historical materialism. Materialism is understood by Marx and Marxism broadly. On the other side, you have what's called middle class materialism. Middle class materialism is the materialism of the Enlightenment. It's the it's the materialism of people like Hume and uh, and like Diderot and Voltaire. It's it's um, it's putting a fight against religion as primary at first. So it's trying to 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 sort of take down systems of belief that are sort of holding man back or humanity back from a natural progress. So inherent in this middle class materialism is what's called the Whig theory of history, which is that history is inexorably t- going towards progress. The Steven Pinker view of the world. Right, That's, right. Right. Steven Pinker is the embodiment of the middle class materialist. So um, what makes them different is that historical materialists mostly think about science as the science of society. So historical materialists are interested in thinking about material conditions as they relate to human beings, interrelating with one another, and then interrelating with the world. That's that's kind of historical materialism. Middle class materialism, as Panacek writes, bases itself upon natural science. So it's more about, well, if we can get the science out there and we can show people that these illusions are are truly illusions, then we can we can create a better world through science. Right. And that's not necessarily wrong. That's that's I think a very progressive step forward in terms of thinking, right? It's much but better it's, than Yeah. It's just but it's limited, right? Yeah. <laughs> Because it can lead to like biological determinism and like kind of like ideas like, yeah, uh, like. <laughs> exactly. Do we have any comments? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say uh, K- Kerrigan brought up the Richard Dawkins describes himself as a cultural Christian in rel- relation to Justin's point. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And and again, if you look at that's a great example of historical materialism in the sense that Richard Dawkins is an old white dude who grew up in, who was born in colonial Kenya in the 40s. So before Kenya was an independent country, it was part of the British Empire. And he is somebody who's a cultural Christian precisely because he doesn't like Islam. And it's not so much that he's fighting against like religious beliefs per se, because Dawkins has sided with like fundamentalist Christians on stuff. It's just more about like anti-Muslim stuff or anti-woke crap or whatever, right? Anti-PC, whatever. Yeah, he's um, recently been pretty like open with his like opinion that it would be a shame if Christianity went away. He just wants the bad religions to go away, which by which he means Islam. So, which is so odd because like as somebody who has been very good at pointing out a lot of the cultural problems of Christianity, he can't seem to, to like have that critique come back to him and show it right in his face. Like it's very very odd. Yeah. Um, but that's part of it. You know, um, so, yeah, so, so, so as we were mentioning, like historical materialism, um, as Panacek writes, you know, looks upon the works of science, the concepts, substances, natural laws and forces, although formed out of the stuff of nature, primarily as the creations of the mental labor of man. These are all concepts, but we've developed these concepts using our brain, which is in reality and in relationship to reality, right? Yeah. So it's not like these ideas come out of the ether. They, they're derived from labor. They're derived from our experience. Um, middle-class materialism, on the other hand, from the point of view of the scientific investigator, sees all this as an element of nature itself, which has been discovered and brought to light by science. So right. it's like discovering gravity or discovering, you know, relativity or whatever. It's, you're not really discovering anything that exists out in the independent it's you're you've you've underlined you've been able to create a theoretical construct that helps explain interrelated phenomena that's really what you're doing right um and you're getting approximations of truth it's not truth with a capital t it's approximation of truth based on existing knowledge um minimal class materialism does think there's like truth with a capital t in the sense of like well this is how nature is like you know how 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 dare you contradict nature right you know, this is the kind of argument that you could hear from people who are like transphobes, right? Right. That, you know, there's a lot of middle class materialism in transphobia in the right. sense that they're like, well, how dare you? Because science says this. And so they think of men and women as being like immutable concepts that can never be uh, kind of fluid. <laughs> they're when also, in reality, yeah, <laughs> they're also incredibly ignorant about what the science actually says. <laughs> <laughs> one, they're yes, they're very <laughs> ignorant about what the science actually says. One and two, at the same time, they're also not recognizing that the 
men and women don't exist naturally in nature. Like that's, those are concepts right. that we have used to describe an interrelated se sequence of phenomena. Yeah, yeah that's and right. Sometime, like, yeah. <laughs> just to, because like, do dogs have men and women? Like, are they like out there going like, no, you're not acting manly enough to no, make the masculine. They don't. Dogs? Like that's they, not yeah. a thing. <laughs> that's not a thing, right? Like it's, it's to, to ask if a dog knows it's a male would make no sense. Yeah. Because to a dog that doesn't have the capacity for abstract thought. It's, it's not a cultural it's not, concept. It's, yeah. It's a cultural concept. Or at the very least, it's a, it's a metaphysical concept that's, again, derived from interrelated experiences that we put under the umbrella of male or under the umbrella of female. Yeah. And the thing is, is that there are things that don't quite fit into those, into that simple binary, right? You have intersex people, you have trans people. Yep. Um, you know, you, and so it, they, those people don't, you have gender fluid people, they don't fit neatly into those little boxes. It, demonstrating the fact that these are mere concepts. They don't exist out in the real world as like a thing that you can grab and touch and hold. Like that's yeah. not how ideas work. Um, and um, so, yeah. Sorry. Uh, just, uh, back to the religious point. Um, uh, yeah. Bemke watches Buffy said, I'd rather keep Satanism and get rid of the rest. I consider myself a cultural Satanist. Sure. I mean, I think that's fine. I mean, generally, my attitude has always been in the way I describe myself is as a humanist, that humanism can be both religious and non-religious. It can be both um, secular and religious, as, as I said, or it could, you know, and so one of the things about humanism is it prides very high. It puts a lot of, of weight upon tolerance and ecumenicalism and cosmopolitanism. Like those are things that matter to me. That's part of the reason why like, I think like authoritarian people, like authoritarian Marxism or like Marxism, Leninism, like it doesn't have any of that. It's, it's not particularly ecumenical. It's not particularly tolerant. It's not particularly, right. it, you know, and it's not particularly secular in that Marxism kind of becomes the state religion rather than being like a philosophy that you learn from and recognize grows and changes based upon new information. Right. It be kind of becomes its own kind of dogma. Um, and yep. which is, I think, extremely problematic and, and something that I think holds back the progress of society. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think that that's my whole thing is it's, if you believe in things culturally that are lending us more towards human flourishing, progress, ecumenicalism, and tolerance, then fine. You're never going to get an argument out of me. Yep. It's when you are believing in things religious or cultural, doesn't have to be explicitly religious, um, that take us away from those broader values that I consider important values um, that I think are universal. They belong to everybody. They're not one group or one sect. I think they're things that everybody wants. Um, then you're kind of an enemy in the sense that you're, you're fighting against those things that I want. Right. And a lot of authoritarian politics, whether it's fascism or Stalinism, it, it is very much an attack upon a lot of these broader goals. It's not it doesn't have any interest in tolerance. It doesn't have any interest in ecumenicalism, it doesn't have any interest in in, you know, freedom of the press or freedom of speech. Um, it, it's not interested in any of those things. And, and they'll sort of say out flippant lines of like, well, how much freedom do you really have in a bourgeois society, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's all true, but that doesn't necessarily mean that like the value of freedom of speech is bad in and of itself. Right. Yeah. Right. The goal of building a society is to get more towards those values of freedom and flourishing and, and connectedness rather than separate them. It's weird, but that's, again, it's why I'm not a Leninist anymore, but it's, 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 um, it's too dogmatic. It's too straightjacketed. And we'll get more into that later. Um, okay. Before we get into sort of talking about some of the key figures that Panacek talks about that that um, Lenin writes about as well, um, do we have any comments, questions, anything else? Uh, nothing that I haven't covered okay. yet already. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are three elite, there's sort of three thinkers outside of Marx to think about that, that Panacek devel devotes his time to. Okay. Um, the three are... Joseph Dietchen, Ernst Mach, and Richard Avenarius. Okay. Um, all three, I think. I hope that's not on the quiz because I'm never going to remember it. No, that's fine. <laughs> there, it's, I think it's two Germans and, yeah, it's two Germans, German Swiss, a Czech, 
uh, Mach was a Czech and Germans. Anyway, these are the kind of people, these are contemporaries of Marx. These are people who are writing at the same time Marx is, and these are subsequently people that Lenin is also reading and learning from. Dietschen was, um, you know, a, he was a theorist who sort of independently came up with the idea of historical materialism, um, independent of Marx and Engels. They kind of did it some at the same okay. time. I would refer to Dietschen as Marxism's Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was, was also the, sort of the co-discoverer of evolution by natural selection, he, just, he sort of discovered that or sort of came up with that theory independently of Darwin, even though Darwin came up with it years before um, and had written about it years before it that we know of, but Russell, Alfred Russell Wallace did too. So Dietchen was a contemporary of Marx. He, he thought positively of Marx and Engels and vice versa. Um, he was a much more uh, freewheeling kind of thinker than Marx was. Marx was very sort of strict and, and rigid in some, time, in some respects. Um, but Dietchen was a little bit more free floating and, and sort of relational in, in, in terms of how he thought about stuff. But Dietchen was very influential and he was one of these guys who was pushing historical materialism forward, much like Marx and Engels were doing. And so as Panacek writes in the book, he said, he, he writes, Marx stated that Marx stated what realities determine thought. So social reality determines thought through our interaction with the world via labor. Dietchen established the relationship between reality and thought. So it's, it's you know, Marx no, kind of tells you how we get to where we are and teach and Dietchen kind of tells you the how. It's, he's telling you how reality and thought can inter interrelate with each other. Um, that mind and matter together kind of constitute the real world. Um, that they they go kind of hand in hand, that, that the mind is a derived from the the physical world and the physical world influences what ultimately becomes the mind as an emergent property this is what we call in philosophy monism ah. so you have two main views of thought you have monism and you have dualism yep. monism is that the mind and the body are the same thing that uh that the body that the mind is derived from the body that you don't have one without the other dualism is that the mind and the body are two separate things and they exist independently so when the mind, when the body ceases, the mind can go on, which is interesting because if you really take that to its logical conclusion, that would also mean that even if the mind dies, the body could go on. Which what does that mean? Does that mean someone's in a coma? Like I, right, I mean, I, right, yeah, like I, is that <laughs> like brain dead? You're, you're brain dead. Like, but then again, like that just reaffirms monism, which is that right. like the mind was an emergent property of the brain. Yeah. Um, and then, and again, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, like natural law. We think about natural law of like, you know, um, like, uh, like Newton's laws of motion. Yeah. Or like gravity, and gravity like and things like that. They're, they're abstract concepts that are developed from phenomena. It's not something that, that exists. Like natural laws are not something like they don't come on down high off from high from God, like the 10 commandments. They're things right. that we sort of think of. Um, and mock will, yeah. Based on observation, right? Like, Based on observation, which, yeah. Which means that our conception of them could be wrong. But, yes. But they're, they are based on observations, and this is how we came up with the idea of natural laws. And that's why it's so fascinating, because <laughs> Lenin writes Imperialism and Material Criticism and publishes it in 1908. This is but a few years from, from Einstein's theory of, of relativity. So ah. we're... And Relatively, relativity changes everything about how, what we understand about the physical world. It, it, it changes our concept of space, time, all of it. Yeah. Um, the relationship between um, light and energy, all of it. And Lenin doesn't really know that. So it, it kind of like his, his ideas feel kind of dated because he didn't really interrogate any of this. He didn't have the full observational No, things, he's so. working with what he had. Yeah. Um, so again, it's, so we think of natural science, and then we also think of Marxism as being the science of societies. So that's all the stuff that's in Dietchen. So Dietchen is somebody who, like, you could say is maybe the most radical of, like, the middle-class materialists. You may not even call him a middle-class materialist at all. You could call him a Marxist, a true historical materialist. Um, the other two thinkers that Panacek talks about are Mach and 
and Avenarius. Um, and suffice to say that both these, Mach and Avenarius, um, Mach was a physicist, so he's somebody who is very aware of a lot of the changing um, scientific studies and the scientific world, especially in relationship to both relativity and quantum mechanics. So those two things are developing as Mach is at the tail end of his career. Mm. Um, and he sort of breaks down things into what he calls elements of knowledge. So it's like, there are no subjects, there are no objects, there are mere elements. The object is an element of experience. The subject is an element of experience. Um, it's not helpful to name them all that. They're just all, this, they're all components of knowledge. Again, this makes him, an, this, again, makes him a monist. The mind and the body are the same thing. The mm. mind and matter are the same thing. That subject and object, that these are artificial distinctions. They're all kind of related and all together. What, what makes him a middle-class materialist is that he's more predicated on understanding natural science rather than the science of society. He's not applying that, notion of a scientific investigation to society as Marxism does um, and as Dietchen does. Um, the other thing is, is that you think about like Mock had sort of what he called the primacy of sensations. So, or that the world consists of our sensations, um, which appears very similar to an enlightenment thinker named Bishop Berkeley or Bishop Berkeley. Barclay was kind of an empirical idealist. And so that's why Lenin later will compare Mach to, to Berkeley and say, oh, well, look, see, he's an idealist. But that's just not true. Like, it's just Lenin either misunderstanding what Mach is trying to say or misrepresenting him. It's probably uh -huh. a little bit of both. Um, and so uh, just as a clear, a clear um, sort of cap on thinking about Mach, uh, Panacek writes, Dietchen's aim was to give clear insight into the role of knowledge and social development for the use of the proletarian struggle. So the proletarian struggle is predicated on our knowledge of social development. That's historical materialism. That's Marxism. Mach's aim was an amelioration of the practice of physical research for the use of natural science. So it's, it's about, it's one's natural science, one's social science. Mm -hmm. um, and, and neither the twain shall meet. Or at least with Dietchen and the Marxists, they're all aware of the natural sciences stuff, but they also do this other stuff on the side too. Right, right. They think of that. They think of the natural sciences as being a part of all of this, whereas the middle class materialists aren't really thinking about any of this. Right. Yeah. That's, what, middle, that's where you get. Sorry, that's where you get yeah. your rejections of the social sciences by people in the like the hard sciences. Right. It's it's again. It's that same distinction once again because. I think people know deep down that if you actually took what we learn from the natural sciences and then think about it in relationship to the science of society, you would recognize like you would recognize that it's actually a tool for the class struggle. Yeah. Like I think it would automatically kind of make you a leftist. I think, you know, it's because <laughs> I'm sorry, like there's that great quote that's often attributed to Che Guevara, which is like, I'm sorry that reality is Marxist. It's like, you know, you, you could broaden that out. Like you could just say reality is essentially you know, fundamentally left. It's not, yeah. you know, the, in, yeah. in, in all of those notions. And what the thing about middle-class materialism is that as the industrial revolution and the rise of capitalism grows, middle-class materialism kind of takes a step back because those who are the most ardent materialists were the working class. They were the proletariat. They were the mm. Marxists. They were the anarchists. They were the leftists or, or socialists of any stripe. They were the ones who were mostly the, the kind of real kind of historical materialists, the, the radical materialists. Yeah. The middle class materialism would give way to sort of a middle class mysticism. So you see a revival of religion. This is something Engels writes about in one of his prefaces to socialism, utopian and scientific is in order to maintain societal hierarchies, um, societies would change um, away from the sort of radical critique of religion to a reinforcement of religion via science. So this is where you get the sort of the Malthusianism, population right. science, race science. All of this is reaffirming a lot of the religious tenets that people believe. Even like uh, evolutionary bio biology nowadays. Yes. Yes. Like evolutionary psychology um, or, or yeah, in back in, I mean, yeah. evolutionary psychology um, or you know, stuff like IQ, right? This is yeah. all that, it, it's all of reaffirming these kinds Great of things. Science. It's formed by ideology. <laughs> yeah. Um, eugenics, all of it. Yeah. Because it is kind of religious in that it's sort of working with established precepts and then working backward. 
which is what a lot of those faux sciences do. Um, and so yeah, for sure. Do we have any comments? Yes, we have a couple. Uh, uh, so earlier, when you asked me if uh, there was any comments left over, uh, Kerrigan had mentioned something about Tiananmen Square, which I didn't see. Uh, oh. But, but she said that she she thought of Tiananmen Square massacre when Justin mentioned Anton Panacek's criticism of Lenin. Right. And that goes back to what Mao's sort of, or what's attributed to Mao, which is that all political power derives from the end of a gun. Um, that, that ultimately... It is violence. And, and, and some of that's true. I mean, if you look at states as states exist, a lot of you know, most of the time or almost exclusively all of the time, they have the monopoly on the use of force. Right. It's that's how states work. Yeah. That before you had diffuse forms of violence that would maintain systems of social cohesion. And instead of you would give away some of your liberty in order to have a central authority of violence that would then maintain it for everyone. Mm. And ideally, like the the whole point of statism is is the argument that people would make is, well, we're, re we're creating the state in order to diffuse and, and ultimately over time lessen the scale of violence. I don't think that's true. It hasn't I really think, worked out though. <laughs> I think if you look at the history of, of humanity, and especially the history of the 20th century, um, state the state is a monolith that has led to the deaths of millions, whether it's in capitalism and in colonialism or imperialism of the West or the, the Soviet experiment or the, yeah. or the uh, communist China or um, fascism. Yeah. And I do want to make sure that we make a distinction between fascism and, and sort of authoritarian socialism or, or Stalinism. Right. Yeah, because those sure. are really two different things. Yeah. People tend to lump them in the same boat. What makes them fundamentally different is that the fascists are ultimately achieving the goals that they want <laughs> um, in their in their use of violence, whereas yeah. like the 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 sort of Stalinists are using the violence to achieve a goal that they ultimately don't really achieve, which is mm -hmm. like worker democracy, um, the the end of of class struggle. The amelioration of, of suffering, like those are the things they argue that they want, but they don't. But they don't really them. get them. Yeah. That what they kind of often get is they sort of beget more violence and more suffering yeah. as a result. Um, and uh -huh. I don't really. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say we got a, a couple more comments here. Sure. Um, so Bemke watches Buffy. Also said, if the mind dies and the body goes on, you become a Canadian professor named Jordan Peterson. That's <laughs> true. I mean, dude was in a coma. I mean, a self-induced coma. Yeah. Um, and Bemke watches Buffy also said Che and Fidel were literally just a doctor and a lawyer. They didn't want to have, phys have to physically fight for their lives. Those professions are supposed to be the opposite of physically fighting. That's true, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, Lenin was a lawyer. Yeah. You know, and Stalin's only real professional training was in seminary, which is interesting to think about. Mao was a teacher. You know, like it's, when you think about that, right, it's, yeah, you know, most politicians end up in those kind of broader categories. You know, um, Lincoln was a lawyer. Lyndon Johnson was a teacher. Um, you know, Eisenhower was a general. Right. Obama was a community organizer. He was also a lawyer. But like it's, you know, and uh, but Lenin was more of a revolutionary than a lawyer. I mean, he was a lawyer and he did for a time practice law, but not very long and not particularly successful. He was much more interested in the revolution, much more interested in being a political uh, operative. All right. And I uh, guess uh, Kerrigan just wanted to clarify that uh, their pronouns are they and them. Oh, sorry. My apologies. Oh. Uh, if I if I said something wrong, my apologies. I, I'm um, sure I did I, for sure this time. So my apologies. My apologies for um, sure. But we, we sincerely appreciate um Yep. you helping us with that and, and we'll make sure to follow that in the future. Thank you. Um, so the last person we sort of talk about is very similar to, to mock and we can cover this briefly before really getting into the beat of it, which is Lenin, um, which is Richard Avenarius, um, who was another sort of German philosopher and the term imperial criticism comes from him. So when Lenin's writing that imperial criticism is the title of his book, he's in ref he's directly referencing to Avenarius. Um, again, people like Mach and Deachin and Avenarius, people don't read these people anymore. <laughs> the only way you know about these people is by reading Lenin or by reading Panacek, right? It's, you don't really read these people. Um, 
But uh, so he, again, was sort of a monist, but would also kind of, in his middle class materialism, put um, sort of muddy the waters of what that materialism represented and sort of kind of put back into the mix a little bit of that mysticism, that divide. Um, and so, you know, they... And so when we think about it in general, what is middle class materialism as it plays out? And essentially what it is, is um, it's, it's pretty much that middle class materialism is much more interested in describing the world rather than changing it. It's, that's all it's really interested in doing. Marxism is that classic, you know, the, the, the theses of Feuerbach, you know, the 11th, 10th or 11th um, uh uh, theses, which is, you know, the philosophers have hitherto uh, have only right. explained the world. The point is to change it. Right. right, right. And Marxism is, is through Marxism's central sort of core is in understanding the world, you also change it. That's kind of, that's the core of it. That's historical materialism. That's Marxism. Um, and that's not what middle class materialism is. It doesn't see the social relationships. It doesn't recognize that fundamentally knowledge is a social activity that it's done through language, it's done through interaction, not just with others, but with the material world, that there's this constant interrelationship between you, the outside world, and others. Um, and it sort, of abs it sort of abstracts everything and separates out everybody and individualizes, and individualizes people and sort of, sort of um, destroys the notion of those interrelated social components of life and of thought and of social progress. Um, and so, you know, as, as Panacek writes, for the middle class philosopher does not feel the necessity to follow up the last consequences to materialism. And he prefers to say somewhere in between expressing the world in ideological terms. Um, so ultimately it always kind of comes back to ideology because if you take materialism to its logical conclusion, you would no longer be sort of bourgeois. You would you would fundamentally be working class. You would be the left. Yeah. You'd be on the left. So that gets us to Lenin. <laughs> I know there's a lot of prefaces to get us to Lenin, but in understanding all these things, we kind of understand where Lenin's coming from. So why did Lenin write materialism and imperial criticism? Panacek argues that he wrote it mainly because a lot of these ideas of Mach and Dechen and Avenarius they were all having a lot of influence on the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, the RSDLP, which would mm. become the Bolsheviks. Um, and Lenin didn't like that. He thought that, that all of it was just a bunch of, you know, bourgeois, you know, uh, piffle that he just was like, I don't, I don't need this around anymore. And, and he did it mainly as an ideological tool that I'm going to write this book. Everybody in the party is going to read this book. They're going to see the, the rightness of what I'm saying. And they're going to see the error in the ways of all these other people. Mm. Because his work is fundamentally written like a prosecutor, he's writing it like a lawyer. This is how Panacek describes it. He's not particularly interested in actually understanding a lot of these writers. So <laughs> Lenin's not that particularly interested in, in, in understanding the complexities of Mach or Avenarius or Dietzian or whoever, or Marx, he's much more interested in sort of having his own particular worldview, his own particular flavor of Marxism um, be the one that comes out on top. So he's constantly referring to Mach and Avenarius as like idealists, or he calls them fideists, which is fideism is a term that basically knowledge is derived by faith. So um, like he really didn't accept like any of what they actually said then. No, <laughs> no, he was much more interested in sort of arguing in, in, in sort of modern parlance, we would say he straw manned them, that, yeah. that he sort of built a version of them that he could then tear down rather than actually interrogating their ideas. Um, and so as, as, as Panacek actually writes it, Lenin, however, manis, manifestly does not care about what Mach really thinks, but about what he should think if his logic were identical with Lenin's. So it's this, Lenin is from this perch of I am I am the one that's right. I have the I have the correct view of materialism. Yeah. And everyone else is wrong. The problem with that, though, is that Lenin makes a lot of sort of serious fundamental mistakes in his own thinking that actually reinforces middle class materialism over historical materialism. That actually undermines his own project. So one of those is that Lenin conflates nature and matter. 
So like when we think of matter, we think of like nature or reality, right? And ultimately landing on a materialism that has quite a bit of idealism kind of baked into it. So it's, and so with Lenin's own materialism, he's not actually going full forward with the historical materialist critique, which is that these developments are a part of the class struggle. They are a part of material conditions, that these are develop these are derived from, from humanity's interaction with, with reality via labor. Those are all things that Marxism was talking about. Um, and Marx and Engels wrote about in the German ideology, in, especially even in relation to religion. Lenin's just interested in attacking religion. So, you know, Panacek makes the argument like you don't hear him talk about the class struggle. You don't hear him talking about the proletariat. You don't hear him talking about historical materialism. What you really hear him talking about is how much he hates religion, okay. which is which is not historical materialism. That's middle class materialism. It's it's putting religion up on this like pedestal that has to be thrown down and sort of idealizing it. And that if we can just get it out of the way, then everything will kind of move forward. Now, why is Lenin doing that? Well, Lenin was greatly informed by the father of Russian Marxism, who um, was uh, Plakhanov, Georgi Pl Plakhanov, who's the father of Russian Marxism, who has the same position. So it's, it's a reflection of the need of Russia to throw off the absolutism of the czar and its endorsement of the church. Um, thus, Lenin's materialism of, is of the middle class kind and not the Marxist, Marxist kind. So he's constantly misrepresenting Mach. He's constantly misrepresenting Avenarius, who were both materialists, but they had very nuanced takes that may have been misrepresented or misunderstood as being idealism, and they weren't. So he's misrepresenting them. Okay. And fundamentally, he's much more on the side of, well, we have to get rid of this religion. If we can get rid of the religion part, then we can move on. That's not Marxism. That's Feuerbach. That's that's you know, the early middle class materialists, that's more enlightenment thinking. That's like Voltaire and stuff. It's, it's okay. David Hume dialogues concerning actual religion. It's more like that. It's, it's not Marxism. And so, yeah, which I guess, yeah, it isn't necessarily bad. It's just mm -hmm. not Marxism, right? Yeah. It's not, it's not bad. And you can even make an argument that it's kind of a version of Marxism, but it's not in the sense that you're not really, you're not, fully implementing a, a notion of historical materialism, which again is highlighting that social reality determines social consciousness, that how we interact with the world determines what we know and who we are and who we, what we know and who we are interacts with the world and also changes it, that it's, it's a dialectical relationship between the two. None of that's really in Lenin's book, according to Panacek. It's all kind of gone. Um, and so how does this affect the Russian Revolution? Um, we'll get into that b before, uh, but before we can uh, respond to some comments. Sure. So uh, earlier, uh, Bemke Watches Buffy asked, can we go further into fascism versus authoritarian Stalinism or leftism? Yes, absolutely. So the way that I think about fascism is, is greatly informed by um, uh, Michael Parenti. And his was greatly informed by um, Daniel Guerin, um, who wrote a classic book called Fascism and Big Business. We might do it on the show at some point. But fascism ultimately is the melding of the corporation and the state. That's what it is. Stalinism or state capitalism is when the state becomes the corporation. Right. And those are really two different things. They sound similar, but they're fundamentally different. So that melding of the corporation and the state that is fascism. If you look at Italy or Germany in the 1920s, Ger Italy in the 1920s, starting the 20s, and, and Germany starting the 30s, you see a, a melding of the, the big corporations in league with the state. So private property still existed. The profit motive still existed. But, it exi but a lot of it was taken up by these massive firms that were melded to government policy. In Stalinism, uh, you have the collectivization of agriculture. You have state ownership of the means of production. So the, the state becomes the corporation, in effect. So a lot of the dynamics that exist in a corporation where you have like the workers and then you have like the managers and then you have like the upper managers, all of those stay there. But instead of those managers and upper managers being people like appointed by like a board of directors, they're 
appointed by the board of commissars. Like it's, right. it's, it maintains a lot of the same structures that would exist in a, in a corporate state and a corporate system, but it's doing it through the state. Um, because both fascism and Stalinism had social democratic provisions in it, right? Whether it was housing, healthcare, so on right, and so forth. Right. Um, and so, but ultimately what does, what do both have in common? And what they both have in common is the complete subordination of the individual to the mass, which is not the same as recognizing that we are all in this together and we're working together. Right, Those are very right. different things. Yeah. Um, but that, that um, individual initiative doesn't matter. Individual choice doesn't matter. Um, that you're all a part of the blob that is, you know, the, the fatherland or the great nation. Right. Yeah. Rather and, than being like, yeah, uh, uh, it's kind of one of these, uh, rather than say celebrating a fallen comrade, it's we sacrifice everybody for the, the well being of the state. Exactly. That's right. So, and Stalin's very clear about that. Um, you know, in the Volkogonov book I'm reading, um, Stalin had no qualms about losing, especially during World War II, like losing tons of soldiers because he's like, well, there's the broader cause. And that's how fascism looks at it too. Yeah. But the real fundamental distinctions between fascism and Stalinism are the way in which economic um, processes are organized. So again, fascism is when the state and the corporation become the same thing. And in, uh, or the state supports the corporation in the pursuit of private gain. And Stalinism is when the corp when the state becomes the corporation and takes over all of those things and the profits or whatever is materially benefited. A lot of it goes to the glory of the, you know, the, the working class or whatever, but it's not really the working class, right? Cause it's, again, the working class has very little input in how any of this is done. Yeah. I, I'm in my, uh, reading, I guess my, my view of things, the profit or the, the benefit always in fascism, it still goes to private hands, right? Yes. And that's right. in, uh, say like authoritarian Stalinism or, or quote unquote communism, you, it, it is the state, which is then still sort of kind of public hands, but even if it isn't always public hands. That's exactly right. And so, um, and that's not to say there wasn't some private ownership in the Soviet Union. Right. There was. So after the Russian Civil War, there was something called the NEP or the New Economic Program where um, under Lenin, where they kind of curtailed a lot of the collectivization and state ownership in the pursuance of sort of short term goals, which was making sure not everybody starved or died. Um, and. And so, but by the time you get to the 1930s and you get to the height of the five, you know, the first of the five year plans, that's when you see collectivization, both of agriculture and industry, state ownership coming back into play under Stalin. Um, and there were people who were harmed by that. And again, they were just sacrifices for the greater good. And that's kind of how it's seen. Um, so, yeah. And that's not to say they're like, that's not to say there weren't achievements under those systems. It's just you have to think about them in the context of what they are. I hope that answers your question. I think it was helpful. Um, so then uh, another one was from Bemke Watches Buffy. I never judge leftists for pushing things aside when they are on a quote unquote quote run. When people criticize Bernie, I'd always be like, do you know what the fuck this man goes through every day? Lenin's not much different in my opinion. Right. And I think that's true, right? They're responding to... They're responding to conditions. Yeah. That's what we talked about in the in the, the Leninism under Lenin episode, where you know a lot of the de decisions made by the early Soviet state were done precisely to maintain the Soviet state. Um, and you know Lenin had this broader theory that you'd have the global revolution. You know Germany would become communist, and, and Poland would come become communist. And then once you popped up, you, you ticked off a couple of these countries, and they would go onto the side of the Soviets. Then Soviets would be stronger. They could then kind of do what they wanted to do. And that never happened. Um, you know the you know, uh, you know the Soviets invaded Poland and tried to bend it to its will, and and didn't and it didn't work. Germany had a revolution. Um, but it was ultimately unsuccessful and led to the deaths of, of um, Liebknecht and, and Rosa Luxemburg, um, who were murdered. Uh, and in, in sort of a, a coalition in league between some of the more right wing of the Social Democrats and the fascists, the brown shirts. Um, and 
So the, the revolution never really happened the way that Lenin wanted it to. And so because of that, um, they had to sort of institute a sort of barrack socialism where they had to sort of batten down the hatches and do, in some respects, what was politically expedient. Um, some of that was some of that was just requisitioning the wealth that the monarchy had held for so long. I mean, there were literally um, millions and millions of rubles, gold and, and precious metals and money that the, the, the monarchy just hoarded for centuries. And the Bolsheviks blew through it. I mean, they basically, they gave out money to buy grain. They gave out money to buy stuff. They bought, they gave money out to other working class movements to try to get them to agitate. They were doing all that, right? And, you know, in the Volkogonov book I'm reading, that scene is being kind of gauche, whereas I think it's actually kind of good. Like right. you're taking the wealth that had been hoarded from the people and you're kind of trying to give it back to the people in some form. Redistribution. Redistribution, right? But the problem is, is again, there's very little democratic input in that distribution, there, that it's all being done by Lenin and the Politburo and the Org Bureau and the People's Commissars. It's not being done by the people. It's, it's, it's this group that is representative of the people. And what do we call that? A republic, you know, which is why, <laughs> you know, what does the R stand for in USSR? It's, you, you know, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Mm -hmm. That's a republic. It's not a democracy. Very yeah. much like in the United States is not a democracy. It's a democratic yeah. republic. Yeah. Um, and you can make an argument that the Soviet Union was an autocratic republic. And in some respects, the United States is an autocratic republic. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that conditions and and, I, and again i'm in some respects i i do have a more positive view of lenin than say panacek does basically just because i'm like he did have to go through some serious shit at the same time i don't think that's a good enough excuse for um you know ending the constituent assembly and establishing yeah. the cheka and political assassinations and the banning of opposition parties like none of that i don't you don't think you have to do any of that we, or at the very yeah. least, if you if you did do it, it may end your social exp socialist experiment before it even gets out of the cradle. Right. Yeah. I, I think I think it's fair to say that, like, uh, from our perspective, many years after the end of the Soviet Union, we have like a whole different kind of perspective to look back on the whole context of it. Right. Yes. Where like when you're in it, maybe you think that decision is the best decision for whatever reason, and you can go now, we can say, well, actually, it just looks like you did a bad thing there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ultimately, yeah. And, and, and what we know from a lot of the research, especially post 1990 or 89, um, with Glasnost and Perestroika under Gorbachev, like the opening up of the country and the opening of the Soviet archives, you get a much grimmer picture of how the Soviet Union actually worked. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you recognize, oh, my God, like, ugh. but I think what's really crucial is that the most important critics of the Soviet Union are people on the left. They're the ones that matter. Yeah. When we're criticizing, we're criticizing it not because we are right wing assholes who want to reinstitute <laughs> capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. Which is how most people crit criticize the Soviet Union. Yes. I'm doing it as someone who has leftist principles. I, I'm, I'm essentially like a libertarian socialist or a council communist, as Panacek was. Um, I believe in socialism means worker power. It doesn't just mean state ownership. Yeah. And, and state ownership can have forms of worker power in it. I, I, not, I could. But ultimately, that's what socialism is to me. It's not just like the government does stuff. Like, and I, I, yeah. I also want to like give you credit specifically and also take a little bit for myself that we're very pluralist in our perspectives. Like, yes. we're not like doctrinaire saying, well, we have all the answers and this is how, you know, we're criticizing it and going, well, maybe they should have been more pluralistic in this way. Maybe they, you know, there's these things that they could have done a little bit better, but maybe they couldn't have. We don't know. Yeah, they were under conditions. You know, it's that great quote from Marx, which is that you know, men make history, but not the conditions of their choosing. It's like people respond to events. It's yeah. not, you know, a lot of life is what you respond to. You know, sometimes you don't have control, so you have to sort of do as much as you can. Ultimately, the problem with the broader Leninist project was that it was fundamentally not, it wasn't like a proletarian Marxism. It was sort of a, I don't know, for, for, for it sounds paradoxical, but it's almost kind of like a bourgeois Marxism where it kind of kept the sort of social theory of development in Marx, but then kind of jettisoned the rest. 
um, kind of kept the middle class materialism, kept some of the Marx's under, Marxist understandings of social development by capitalism, that kind of stuff. And then ultimately, it kind of becomes this kind of mix, which at some point people call dialectical materialism or diamat or Marxism, Leninism, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But it's predicated on maintaining some kind of power structure. Um, the power structure doesn't change. It, it, the power structure doesn't go away. It changes. Yeah. So instead yeah. of it being the monarch or the and and the church, it's you know it's the general secretary and the politburo and the commissariat and the yeah, that's who it is. And so um, you know, fighting against merely the clergy is kind of middle class materialism, which is what which is what Panacek criticizes him for. And ultimately, the ideology of the Russian Revolution was. As he writes, he calls it two characters. He says it's middle class, mater- middle class revolution and its immediate aims, um, proletarian revolution and its active forces, meaning that the working class and the peasantry are actually doing it. The, the appropriate Bolshevik theory, too, had to present two characters, middle class materialism and its basic philosophy and proletarian evolutionism and its doctrine of class fight. So it kept that component, but its materialism is fundamentally not rooted in Marxism. Um, and because of Lenin's failures as a revolutionary, um, you know, the proletarian movement under the banner, banner of Marxism was largely sidelined. Like that's what Panacek argues. Like Lenin's success was kind of a failure for other forms of Marxism, which is true. Um, if you look at the world and when people think of Marxism, it, the, the Leninist form of it dominates. It's, it's, it, you know, because the Soviet Union was around for over 70 years and then you had China, which is still exists today, which is still largely the Leninist or Maoist model. Maoism is a derivative of Leninism. Cuba is like that, you know, so existing, so real existing socialism, right, is, is under the sort of broader Leninist banner. And I think because of that, it does limit our capacities to think of something different, that we could be different. Um, yeah. and that's not to say that I want like the West to like intervene and, and like coup these countries. God, <laughs> no, no. no, like the China under worse. the communist party is still much better than if like China got taken back over by the government of Taiwan. Like, right. Jesus Christ. But ultimately what we really want is a proletarian revolution. And for Panacek, that means, um, principles of worker rule under workers councils. So he was a council communist. He's right. very similar to Rosa Luxemburg. Um, and it's probably fair to say that Panacek might be the most influential Marxist on Noam Chomsky. Mm-hmm. Um, so Chomsky's form of anarcho-syndicalism is greatly informed by Panacek and Rosa Luxemburg. Because people often think, oh, well, Chomsky's kind of hard on Marxism. No, he's hard on Leninism. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And that's really like he's, he's more hard on Leninism than he is anything else. And for right reasons, right? Because it's ultimately... Um, you know, the party of the Soviet Union became the new elite and the masses were subjected to them. Yeah. And if you didn't fall in line, you were punished. You know, uh, when I read in uh, a book that was actually supposed to be fairly positive for the Soviet Union, a book written in like the 30s or the 40s called Soviet Democracy by this journalist whose name is Pat Sloan. He talked about what they called the party cleanses, which is when you basically people would have to say, or were you sufficiently, uh, were you sufficiently helping the party? And if you were, then you stayed a party member. And if you weren't, they kicked you out. It's, 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 and some of that's true, right? If people aren't following your program, then they shouldn't be a part of your group. That's fair. I understand that. But to make it this like public event, it, it, it seems very similar to like, I don't know, like a public flogging of like, did you, you know, did you do, did you follow all the tenets of the church, my son? No. Then we must punish you. You know, it, it feels shame, very, shame, shame, shame. <laughs> yeah, it feels very much like that, right? It's not. It's not a discussion. It's much more of a, um, it's more of a ruling. Yeah. And quite frankly, that's how the Soviet Union ruled, especially during the Stalin period. I mean, it, you have the party purges. Um, you have the terror of the 30s, where you had people who were removed from power. And people who will argue, like they'll say, well, some of these people were subversive. They were trying to undermine the Soviet Union. That, maybe that's true. I don't know. All I know is that with the purges, Stalin removed a tremendous amount of people within the party leadership, including military leadership, so that when the, when, when the Nazis ultimately um, invaded Russia in 1941, Stalin got kind of caught with his pants down because he didn't really know what to do. Um, and uh, so they had to kind of start from scratch because he had removed so many people. 
right. either exiled in Siberia or merely killed them. So um, do I think sometimes with bourgeois historians, did they overplay how many people died or maybe, I don't know. But what I can tell you is that the numbers don't really necessarily matter. What matters are the methods and what's going on. If people are going to quibble about numbers, to me, that just seems like, I don't know, like, and that seems like arguing over nothing. It's like yeah. arguing how many angels are on the head of in a lot, pin. In a lot but, of ways, it misses the point, right? It really does kind of miss the point. I, um, I yeah. do particularly take issue with the hundred million deaths under communism number. Right. Because <laughs> that's absurd, right? Because they're never going to say that there are hundreds of millions of deaths or a hundred million deaths under capitalism, whether it's the transatlantic slave trade or colonialism exactly. or imperialism. Um, ethnic cleansing, like any of that, right? Because they never factor that in because they treat capitalism as if it's a natural thing. That's unfair. I think that's arguing out of bad faith. But it is fair to say that if you look at historians who've looked at the Soviet archives, like you know, Dmitry Volkogonov, who was in the Soviet government for years, you know, it, he knew, like he, he, was, he lived it. It wasn't, it wasn't just that he was thinking about it as a distance, he lived it. So yeah. he knew, he worked in it, he lived within it. So it's like, that's the thing. Um, there's a great quote that uh, Panacek has about this real distinction between authoritarianism and, and sort of libertarian socialism. So he says, its object, the proletarian revolution, cannot be to replace the domination of stock jobbers and monopolists over a disorderly production by the domination of state officials over a production regulated from above. Its object is to be itself master of production and itself to regulate labor, the basis of life. Only then is capitalism really destroyed. And I think that's right. I think that if you're maintaining a hierarchy, which determines what the vast majority of people do, I don't think that's really socialism. Or if it is, it's not a socialism that I would want. Right, yeah. And that's not to say Certainly that there aren't not liberatory. Be... <laughs> right. And that's not to say that there aren't systems of like authority or governance, but those have to be those have to be justified. You know, yeah. that's that's the yeah. you have to justify why you're doing these certain things. And I think that ultimately the the Leninist project failed for a variety of reasons. I mean, it failed because of I think misunderstandings of philosophy, as Panacek noted. Um, it failed because ultimately it was a rather weak system that once you kind of bend it, once you opened it up a little bit with Perestroika and with Glasnost, mm. um, it couldn't handle it. It just couldn't handle it. It was, it was not, you know, it, it was not something that because the system was built upon secrecy and authority from above yeah. and, and peop and elites running power. You know? Yeah, as long so as you have that that system of like you say, like the authority, like it, it is so fragile. As soon as like anyone like, undermines that authority through propaganda or through more democracy or what have you, even mm -hmm. outside threats, it's all it is going to crumble eventually. Right, and I think that when you look at the Soviet Union compared to say like China is a good example. Mm. The Soviet Union tried to liberalize very quickly. It essentially tried to do it over a period of six years. China did it over a period of 20 years. Right. 30 years. It was, it was a much broader time. And so a lot of the methods that were instituted in China separated it from the Soviet Union in that it liberalized economically, but it didn't liberalize politically. And the Soviet Union tried to do both. And that's where it fell apart. And so, um, so ultimately, a real worker society is one that the workers actually control. That yep. you don't have this elite lording over everybody else. Because if you have that elite that's kind of telling everybody else what to do, is that really socialism? No, it's capitalism. Yeah. But whether it's state run or not. Um. So I guess we got a handful of comments here. If we want to get okay. Um, yeah, we can do that. And we can finish up. Okay. So. Kerrigan mentioned uh, your point about corporate fascism is basically right-wing libertarianism summed up. 100%. I always say that um, if, uh, you know, if you, if you prick a libertarian, a fascist bleeds, a right libertarian. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, and way, uh, quite a bit earlier, Screaming Palm said, I always hated Lenin's circular logic rhetoric. The dictatorship will become unnecessary when classes disappear. Without the dictatorship of the proletariat, they will not disappear. Exactly. Exactly. 
Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's a, a fundamental problem. Part of that is because Marx never really got to write his, his fundamental work on the state. He right. didn't live long enough. Yeah. So what we know about Marxism in, in relation to the state or in relation to socialism is limited. And that, I think, comes through in Lenin's own limitations. Fair. Um, Bemke watches Buffy. He said, Soviet Union had so many viewpoints and grievances from every end. I don't know how Stalin lasted as long as he did, regardless of his level of support. The numbers are mostly because of resources in World War II and post-World War II. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in Volkogonov's book, um, Anatomy or, or Autopsy for an Empire, um, he talks about this. So Stalin ruled the Soviet Union basically as the top guy for 31 years. So you can make the argument that he became, you know, he becomes the head, he becomes like general secretary in 1922 um, and dies in 1953. Um, he maintained power for a very long time for a variety of reasons. Part of that was um, his connection to Lenin. He tied himself to Lenin very closely. So he sort of saw himself as the heir to Lenin. Um, even though Lenin may have wanted other people to be in the role because towards the end of his life, Lenin had second thoughts about Stalin. Um, a lot of the functionaries, the people that worked under, under Stalin were sycophants. Um, he didn't, he got rid of potential uh, rivals very quickly, whether it was Bukharin or Stalin, uh, or, um, Trotsky or, um, uh, those are the two main ones, Malenkov, like, uh, a lot of the guys, and some of the guys are really tied to Lenin. He got rid of too. So you get rid of these people who have a relationship with Lenin. You get rid of these people who have like who are go back to the revolution or even go back further. Um, you get rid of those people and you replace them with your own guys. Um, and then uh, fundamentally, he was very good at creating um, a system of kind of perfect control. Um, and people often say that Stalin was sort of a, a rejection of Leninism. And, and you could maybe make that argument. I know Trotsky is too. Yeah. But if you really look at it, like, no. Like, a lot of the stuff that that, Trump, that Stalin did was stuff that was sort of instituted by Lenin. He didn't Whether tear it all down and rebuild it in his own image. He just kind of... No. Some of it was know, good like, for him, right? He, he liked Like the it. KGB, right? Yeah. Like, the precursor to the KGB was the NKVD. And the precursor to that was the OGPU, and the precursor to that was the Cheka, yeah. and the Cheka was created by Lenin. So, you know, that secret police, political assassinations, banning of political parties, like all of that happens under Lenin. You know, the execution of the Romanovs happens under Lenin. Like it's, it's, yeah. and trust me, I'm not going to be crying a tear about the Romanovs. Right. I'm just saying, like, political assassination and state sponsored terror were, were things that happened under the Lenin period. Yeah. Stalin takes them and sort of amps them to 11. And that's really like the, um, and, and also it was a bureaucracy. He had a, he had a deft hand at bureaucracy. World War II could have been the period where he, he, um, he could have seen his power lost or the, the Korean war, which didn't go particularly well for the Soviets either. Um, so, uh, and when he dies, he doesn't really have a handpicked successor. Um, and then there's a power struggle. Um, and ultimately it's Khrushchev and then Khrushchev doesn't last very long because he's, he's too reformist. Mm -hmm. He's not of the old line. So, but anyway, I, that's, those, that's part of the reason I think he lasted for so long. Yeah. Um, and I guess one more from Bebke watches Buffy, uh, comparing the Soviet union to China is kind of insane though. In that regard, they had so many different factions. Without a doubt. I agree with you a thousand percent. And, and in fact, if you look at the history, like the Sino-Soviet split was real, yeah. especially by the 1950s, you know, China was always going to be very different. Then that's why the idea of monolithic communism was always absurd on its face, because every communist state that's ever existed has been different from the other one. Yeah. Um, they all do things differently based on material conditions. They're responding to what your country has at any given time. Right. Literally in forms. the core philosophy <laughs> is yeah. the reason why it has to be different wherever it is. Exactly. And it's not even just in pol it's not even just in politics. It's even culturally. Yeah. Um, Volkogonov writes about how Mao and Stalin were very different from one another. So Stalin was very much the guy who, you know, he would quote Lenin or he would quote himself, whereas like, or Marx or whatever, whereas like Mao would often bring out, he had a lot more learning. He had learned a lot more ancient Chinese philosophy. Like he, you know, so he's like quoting like, you know, Lao Tzu and whatever. Um, and it was a very different style. 
Yeah. Ultimately, right. um, the peasantry was a much more vibrant, like a much larger force in China than even in the Soviet Union. So you have right. that component too. Um, and of course, you have like the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward being the most similar to say the Soviet collectivization of agriculture in the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, but the great, but the Cultural Revolution especially is something that um, <laughs> it makes China very different. Its conditions very different from what the Soviet Union would be. But they were very they have very very different systems. Um, ultimately, the the Chinese system is a much more um, flexible one. Um, it's not as brittle as the Soviet one, one, one was, primarily because it started to economically liberalize far earlier than the Soviets did. Right, right. That's one factor among many. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for your wonderful comments. And I apologize to anyone who wanted uh, one brought up that I didn't bring up. Uh, but I guess we're closing the end. So what are we covering next time? So next time um, we're doing a, a, a Kerrigan request. Um, we're going to be doing um, Giannis Varoufakis' newest book called Techno Feudalism. So we've been doing a lot of history. Let's talk about the present a little bit. Nice. We're going to do something a little more timely and talk about his new book, Techno Feudalism, which I'm, I'm very much looking forward to reading. Um, I think one of his big ideas is that he basically argues that capitalism is dead and that the, that this sort of techno feudalism is, is in its place. Oh. So it'll be very interesting to um, to read him. I, I think he's a fascinating guy and, and infinitely interesting. So yeah, that's what we'll be covering uh, next time. Please be, uh, so uh, Kerrigan asked that I read her or their latest comment, um, which was, I think I repeat, my, uh, that's the most recent one I can see anyway. Uh, I repeat my previous comment about corporate fascism being right-wing libertarian to take it to its logical extreme. Yes. I I'm very much of the mind because what, what does fascism do? It hollows out the state in service of corporations. So that's really ultimately what it, what, what it is. And that's what libertarians want to do because they hate the state, but not for the reason that we may hate the state right. or hate how statecraft exists. Yeah, for sure. All right. So uh, where can people find you? So you can find me at uh, justinclark.org. There's the website right down there. Um, I've recently updated the blog. It's been almost a year since I'd updated the blog. Um, and so uh, on Instagram, I write little book reviews for things that I, I read outside of the show. And I've started collecting a lot of those under four or five of those into posts. So I just made the first post this week called Science and Society. It's, nice. a, review. it's a collection of five reviews. Um, so you'll see more and more of those on the blog. Um, as I've been um, kind of going through the ones that I think are worth kind of putting up there for people to check out. Um, I'm also working on other material for my day job with the Indiana Historical Bureau. Stay tuned with that. Um, and uh, and so you can also find me on social media. I'm at Justin Clark PH. Uh, PH stands for public history. I'm on Instagram, TikTok threads, Blue Sky, but I'm mostly active on Instagram. I try to do TikTok, but it's so much to keep up with. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, as I'm getting older, it's, it's, I, I just, I can't keep up with this it. too much. Going it's on. too much. So it's too much, but yeah, I'm mostly active on Instagram. And as always, please consider becoming a patron, um, patreon.com forward slash skeptical leftist, um, or skeptical leftist. Uh, if you search it, um, Corey does a tremendous amount of hard work outside, not just red reviews, but the great interviews that he does his show he does with his partner. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we got to keep the lights on got to make sure we can we can continue to do the show yeah. for you um and keep putting out this high quality content for you um so you know and if you can't do that please give this video a like give us a subscribe this doesn't right. sound like your typical influencer <laughs> um you know you know yeah. leave a comment um you know if we think it's a pretty good comment i'll usually respond to it um and if, so if it's Corey. trash i'll delete it <laughs> I know that's what I do now too. I'm just like delete, I'm not even, get out of here. I don't even fuck around. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, but definitely please consider becoming a patron. Um, that really helps. I uh, I guess before we close out, I just want to say like I I'm no longer going to be paying for the skepticalleftist.com website. So oh, okay. if people want to email me, it's mind of a skeptical leftist at gmail .com. Kerrigan, that's where you can uh, send your book uh, suggestions. Um. And for like, I'm putting that money into other tools, hopefully that can make okay. the show better. So that's good. I think that's, I think that's smart. Um, and then if you guys do want to contact me, you can always email me um, uh, directly through my website. Um, so there's a contact me page. You can contact me there.
For sure. Right on. Yeah. Uh, the six people who went to uh, our, our my website every month or whatever it was, it was not worth $25 or $30 a month. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, again, I apologize for any comments I didn't get to. I hope everybody mm-hmm. enjoyed the, tonight's show, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. All right. See you then. All right, folks. That's all for now. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share the show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it and it helps me keep the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie at Hope, uh, Some Random Geek, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron, and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a Substack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I would like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat. strange to me it is very odd and it's also counter to what you're taught as a child because like there are certain things you're taught as a child that then society beats out of you like the um like sharing sharing (laughs) don't hit people um don't um don't say mean things to others don't judge people because they're different um wait your turn you know you know be polite like all these basic things that we teach children clean up after yourself yourself, (laughs) care about others share all those things that we teach little children and then you get to a point where life beats all of those good values out of you or those good lessons out of you and it makes people into these like feral selfish fuckers who just don't care it's kind of remarkable yeah. to watch people act like petulant children when they don't get what they want. It, it, it's kind of amazing. Um, yeah. And trust me, I've done it. Like we've all done it. Like it's, oh, it, yeah. and you feel ashamed about it. But when you're seeing it from the outside, it's like pretty it sad, is. right? It's pretty terrible. You're like, wow, what a fucking <laughs> asshole. Like, was I was shitty once. Yeah. <laughs> or, or you're like, or even in the moment where you, where you're bad and then you like, or you're just act like a total fucking asshole. And then like you get back and you're like, I feel like shit. I did that once to a, uh, a parking cop, yeah. which I mean, they're a parking cop. They're, they're not really a real cop. No. Right? Still a bastard though. <laughs> so, still a bastard. <laughs> but, but she did not deserve my derision and my, you know, I was quite cruel. Yeah. Actually. I, and it, and it was my fault.